Wilkie Collins's short novel The Haunted Hotel was serialised from June to November 1878 and is a powerful combination of ghost story and detective mystery. This BBC Radio full cast dramatisation was first broadcast in 2012. The Haunted Hotel by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio by Rod Beecham terribly crowded. Would you mind if I shared your table? Oh, not at all. Please feel free to do so. Thank you. Adele gives wonderful tea parties, but she does tend to ask half of London. <laughs> I don't think we've met, have we? Not to my knowledge, no. My name is Agnes Lockwood. And you are... You are Agnes Lockwood? Yes. And you pretend not to know who I am? I'm terribly sorry. Should I know you? I am the Contessa Narona. I see. I had no idea. Oh, you must hate me. Of course I don't hate oh. you. No, really. It was made quite clear. I'm aware that you knew nothing of my situation. Will you believe me that... When I discovered the truth, I tried to convince him to honour his obligations. Of course I believe you. But it would have made no difference. No woman would want to spend her life with a man who clearly wishes to spend it with someone else. However, in the circumstances, I'm sure it would be better for both of us. Oh, oh wait. Please. Can I ask you to do something for me? Let me see your face. If you insist. If you would just lift your veil for a moment. Is that too much to ask? Of course not. <clears throat> there. My face. For what it's worth. <gasps> oh. My evil angel. What? What is it? Oh, oh. oh Contessa, can, can somebody help me, please? What's the matter, miss? This lady, I think she's fainted. Can you get me some smelling salts? Oh. Agnes, what has happened? Oh, Adele, I, I don't know. I, she wanted to look at my face. Your face? And then she fainted. But her expression, I, I've never seen anyone look so frightened. Come in. There's a lady, sir. She insists on seeing you. Does she indeed? Well, she can insist as much as she likes. I've had a trying day. And as soon as I finish these notes, I intend to spend a quiet evening at my club. Um, she's a countess, Doctor. I don't care if it's Her Majesty herself. Tell her she can come back in the morning. It may be too late in the morning. Madam, you can't just Doctor walk in. My brow. You have the reputation of being the sort of man who never runs away from a chance. Uh, do I indeed? So I simply want you to answer one straightforward question. Uh, and what is that? Whether or not I am going mad. Uh, madam, I think you have been given an exaggerated notion of my abilities. All I ask is five minutes of your time to tell you my story and to hear your opinion. Uh, all right, Robert, you may leave us. Well, if you're sure, Doctor. <laughs> Quite sure. Very well, madam. You have my full attention. Oh, doctor. This afternoon, I met someone. Someone I had unintentionally wronged. A young Englishwoman who had been engaged to the man I am going to marry. A woman of whose existence, I give you my word, 
He had been totally unaware until after I had agreed to become his wife. I see. Indeed. When I discovered the truth, I offered... I insisted that he honored his obligation. But then he showed me a letter from the woman herself. A noble, high-minded letter releasing him from his promises. But also one that made it clear, gently but firmly, that there was no hope under any circumstances of ever renewing their relationship. Go on. He... He appealed to my compassion. You know what women are. I was too soft-hearted. And we are to be married this very week. I can see this has been very distressing for all parties, Contessa. But you spoke of madness. This afternoon, as I say, I met her by chance... We exchanged a few words. And then... I don't know why. I was seized with a need to study her face. To look into her eyes. But when I looked into them... I felt a terror that I have never felt in the whole of my life. A terror of what, exactly? Retribution. I felt at that moment she knew I was going to commit some dreadful crime and that she would make me pay for it. And then? I fainted. And when I recovered, she was gone. Well, tell me. Am I mad? I think the best explanation I can offer is that you feel some sense of understandable guilt towards this woman, which you have tried to rationalise but can't, and that when you met her it transformed itself into this irrational sense of foreboding. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, The mind is a strange organ, madam, which we are only just beginning to understand. Is that the best you can do, Doctor? Then I really am... Doomed. Why, Brown? You're very late this evening. I'd just about given you up. I was unexpectedly detained by a lady. Really? Well, do sit down and tell me about it, always assuming it's fit for my tender ears. Waiter, bring me a large whiskey, will you? Yes, Mm. Doctor. Obviously, the ladies put you through it. Tell me, have you ever heard of the Contessa Nerona? (laughs) I take it that means you have. And am I to take it that you're the only man in London who hasn't? What a sheltered life you doctors lead. Certainly. I pay very little attention to casual gossip. Was it the Contessa in person who detained you? An extraordinary woman. Fascinating and utterly repellent. As pale as death. And her eyes. At once the cruelest I've ever seen and, and the saddest. What do you know of her? A great deal, and none of it to the lady's credit. But, as you say, you're not partial to casual gossip. I think it would be fair to say that, in this instance, my interest is professional. (laughs) Of course. Well, they say she was, in fact, never married to the Count whose widow she claims to be, that she narrowly escaped being implicated in a poisoning trial in Vienna, that she was a spy for the Austrians in Milan, and that the man she claims is her brother isn't really her brother at all. What man is this? Your whiskey, sir? Ah, thank you. He calls himself Baron Rivard. Word has it that he's a gambler at every table on the continent, and that most recently Milady herself had to flee Paris under the accusation of running an illegal gambling salon. But I don't understand. What man of any sense or breeding would break off his engagement to marry such a woman? Hmm. Uh, Would I have heard of him? That depends if the name Mulberry means anything to you. You're not serious. Never more so. Herbert John Westwick, first Baron Mulberry of Mulberry, Kings County, Ireland. That's the fish your Contessa has landed for herself. But the man must be mad. That's the kindest way of looking at it. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Henry, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were there. Don't distress yourself, Carstairs. Nothing you can say about my brother that would offend me. 
Unless, of course, you were foolish enough to try and defend him. It's a sad business, certainly. It's a vile business. The way my brother has treated Agnes is vile, beyond belief. There's no other way of putting it. Quite. D will you join us, Henry? Oh, if, if I'm not intruding. No, no, of course not. Whitebrow, this is Henry Westwick, Mulberry's youngest brother. How do you do? Except that he is no longer my brother. I told him so to his face. The thing is, Whitebrow has just come hot foot from an interview with the lady herself, the mm. so-called Contessa. Really? May I ask what you made of her, Doctor? I found her to be a very uh, troubled woman. I'm delighted to hear it. She's caused enough trouble for others. Yes, but to be fair, well, you know, women, they go where their hearts lead them. Always assuming they have a heart. No, but I mean, she's hardly marrying him for his money. The estate is entailed, surely. I mean, if anything happened to Mulberry, she wouldn't see a penny of it. Not of the estate, no. But I happened to learn only this morning that my brother, the Mulberry, has insured his life in her favour for the sum of £10,000. <laughs> Sounds like Mulberry's walked into a hornet's nest. Well, he only has himself to blame. After the way he's treated poor Agnes, he deserves anything that happens to him. Now, <clears throat> if you'll excuse me, gentlemen. Of course, yeah. of course pleasure to me. Oh, poor young devil. He certainly seems passionate about his brother's behaviour. No, no. He's in love with the girl himself. With Miss Lockwood? Yes. Well, they're cousins, you know. Agnes practically grew up with Herbert, Henry and Francis. He's the middle brother, next in line to the title. And Henry's been sweet on her since they were children. Rumour has it Henry even proposed to her. But she preferred the eldest brother. Agnes felt about Montbarry the way Henry feels about her. Maybe even more passionately. Montbarry and your Contessa between them. They broke Agnes's heart. Yes, Megan, what is it? It's Master Henry, Miss Agnes. Wondering if he might have a word with you. I, uh, I'm not sure if at the moment... He's I... going away, Miss. He wants to say goodbye before he leaves. All right. Show him in. Right. Agnes, my dear, I just... Oh, I'm sorry. I've come at a bad moment. You're, You're burning his letters? You've come at exactly the right moment, Henry. This is the very last one. Oh, there. That's done. Now that they're actually married, it seemed appropriate somehow. Agnes? Did you go to the church? Of course I didn't. How could you even think it? None of the family went. Not even Francis. Well, Francis least of all. He feels even more contempt for Herbert than I do. And even if he wanted to, do you think Susanna would have let him? Oh, Susanna is a dear... She's just written, in fact, asking me to go and stay with the family. Shall you go? I think so. It will help me take my mind off. I understand Montbarry and the Contessa went abroad the day after the marriage. Because no decent person would look them in the face. I think they're in Italy somewhere. They could be in hell for all I care. F forgive me. And now Megan tells me you're going abroad. I'm out of spirits, Agnes. I, I, I want a change. Besides, if I stayed here... There are things I might say to you that probably better left unsaid. For the moment, anyway. Excuse me, miss, I'm sorry to disturb. But little Mrs Ferrari is here, wondering if she might say a few words to you. Uh, of course. Henry, you remember Emily Bidwell, my favourite pupil at the village school. Mm. She married an Italian courier named Ferrari, but I'm afraid it hasn't turned out very well. Do you mind my having her in for a minute? I'd be happy to see her some other time. I think probably it's best if I say goodbye. As you wish. Take care of yourself, Henry. This way, sir. Don't be downhearted, Mr Henry. Try her again when you come back. Well, Emily, what can I do for you? I'm afraid to tell you, miss. Afraid? Have I become some sort of dragon? Is it your husband? 
Who's making you afraid? No, no, miss. In his own way, he's devoted to me and the children. But he has got a temper on him, especially if he's not working. But didn't you tell me he had an engagement to take some ladies to Italy? That fell through, miss. And it's left him lost in the queue for any more work that's going. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. The thing is, miss, if he could be privately recommended... Oh, I see. Because a letter inquiring for a good courier came to the office this morning. Six months, at least, travelling through Italy and then staying on in Venice. Only there are other people ahead of Mr Ferrari. But if he could send off his testimonials with a special recommendation from you, it, it might just turn the scales. Why, yes, of course. Who are the people concerned? Emily? Oh, I'm ashamed to tell you, miss. What on earth do you mean? It's Lord Montbarry. Emily! How could you? Oh, I'm sorry, miss. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I'm not quite as bad as you think me, but I beg your pardon all the same. No, wait. Wait. You must have been desperate to have dared to ask this of me. Oh, money's getting very short, miss. Ferrari's temper's getting shorter. And there are the children... But I expect we'll manage. No, no. You're right, Emily. It's not really such a terrible thing to ask. Oh, God bless you, miss. you really go back to London tomorrow, Agnes? Susanna, I really must. There are things I have to do. We'll all miss you, especially the children. You've been here no time at all. <laughs> I've been here a good three months, Susanna. I can't trespass on your charity any longer. Oh, nonsense. There's no question of charity. Or if there is, we're the ones on the receiving end. Whatever do you mean? The children absolutely adore you. In fact... Francis and I were discussing it only last night, and we were saying... Uh, no. No, you'd probably be offended. Susanna, what are you trying to say? We were wondering what you would think of formalising the arrangement, becoming the children's official governess. Oh, there, now I have offended you. No, you haven't. Not in the least. I think it's a wonderful idea. Really? Then you'll do it. Can I think about it? Just for a week or two? Oh, please do. Please do. And you know what travellers we are. I promise you, you'll see the world. Oh, Miss Agnes. Thank heavens you're back. Megan. Whatever is the matter? It's little Mrs Ferrari. She's been here all day waiting for you. She's in a dreadful state, dreadful. Emily? Oh, miss, whatever could have happened to him? I don't understand. Happened to whom? My husband. It's Ferrari, Miss Agnes. He's left Lord Montbarry without a word of warning. And nobody knows what's become of him. Who told you this? The courier's office, miss. The secretary himself. Calm yourself, Emily. I'm sure there's some perfectly reasonable explanation. What explanation could there be, miss? I know he's not always the best of men, but to walk away from his employers without a word... Why would he do such a thing? Was there nothing in his letters that might give you some sort of explanation? Not really, miss. I have them all here. The last one, perhaps. It, it made me feel uneasy when I read it, but, but it still doesn't explain anything. May I? Of course, miss. Maybe you'll see something I couldn't. Dear Emily, more of my lord's economy. Instead of going to a hotel, we have hired a damp... Instead of going to a hotel, we have hired a damp rambling old palace. Apparently, it comes cheaper for a two-month term. My lord tried to get it for longer. He says the peace of Venice is good for his nerves. But a foreign speculator has acquired the palace and is going to turn it into a hotel. The Baron is still with us. He and his lordship seem to disagree more and more with every passing day. What about exactly, I couldn't say. But it seems to be to do with money. And it's had a bad effect on Milady as well. She was much nicer before the Baron arrived. 
The result is Lord Mowbray shuts himself up in his own room with his books and sees as little of his wife and the Baron as possible. The thing is, I've heard the rumours that the Baron and Milady are something quite different from the brother and the sister they claim to be. If my lord's suspicions are once awakened, the consequences will be terrible. However, the pay is good, and I cannot afford to talk of leaving. You see, miss, he can't afford to talk of leaving, and yet within a week of writing that letter, he just ups and walks out. At least, that's what she says. She? The so-called Contessa. That's what she wrote to the courier's office. But you think she's lying? Oh, I don't know what to think. Oh, miss, what should I do? It's Mr Henry, miss. Ah, oh, Henry! How wonderful! Just the person I wanted to see. Agnes. In fact, I was just writing to you. I very much need your advice. My advice? About Emily, Mrs Ferrari. Something very strange as... Henry... What is it? I, um, <clears throat> I, I have some news. Bad news, I, I suppose. Yes, even in the circumstances, it's very bad news. Montbarry is dead. Dead? Herbert is dead? I'm afraid so, yes. But when? How? Bronchitis. But... Herbert never suffered from bronchitis. Apparently it came on very suddenly. I don't know very much about it. It seems he had a most able physician in attendance, a Dr Bruno. But there was nothing he or anyone else could do. I see. I'm so sorry. In a sense, he was dead to me already. I would never have seen him again in this life. Oh. I think perhaps I should uh, lie down for a little. Of course. M M Megan? M Megan! Whatever is it? Could you help her to bed? He's dead. Lord Montbarry. Herbert. Is dead. Oh, my poor, poor lamb. H how is she? Oh, she'll be all right, sir. I've given her one of my sleeping drafts. Is there anything I can do? No, not at the moment, sir. But come back in the morning. She'll be needing you. What on earth is that? Emily! Where's Miss Agnes? I have to see her. Well, you can't. She's sleeping. Emily? What's all this about? Oh, sir, sir, they've killed him. What? Who are you talking about? That Contessa and her Baron's so-called brother. They've murdered him. Lord Montbarry? No, my husband. The pair of them had done away with Mr Ferrari. There's no other explanation. What on earth makes you say that? Because of this. It came in the post this morning. A cheque made out in my name for £1,000. No. And this is the note that came with it. To console you for the loss of your husband? You see, sir, it's blood money. What else can it be? Are you sure you want to talk about this, Agnes? Perhaps you shouldn't excite yourself. But what on earth can it mean? Who can have sent it? Well, this is the thing. We know that now. Emily made inquiries at the insurance company. It was my brother. Herbert? He sent the money. And so it would appear. The doctor, Dr Bruno. Apparently Herbert placed it into his hands with urgent instructions to put it in the post immediately. But why would he do that? I don't understand. Neither does anyone else. Well, perhaps Emily will find out the truth. She's gone to see the Contessa. The Contessa is in England? In London, at Norbury's Hotel. She arrived yesterday. But why has she come back? Oh, why do you think? to collect the £10,000 that became due to her on my brother's death. What is it you want from me? It's very simple, my lady. 
I come to acknowledge the receipt of the money sent to Ferrari's widow. Are you mad or drunk? I'm no more mad or drunk than you are, my lady. Ha! Then you are only insolent, like so many of your countrymen. My lady... You walk in here. You mention the name of a courier who left us very strangely. Are you his wife? I'm not his wife. I'm his widow, as you very well know. Oh, it was an evil hour when Miss Lockwood recommended my poor husband to be his lordship's courier. What did you say? I said it was an evil hour. <coughs> <coughs> liar. You liar. Tell me that you're lying, or I swear to God, I'll strangle you with my own hands. I, 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 I don't. Don't tell me that you lied when you used Miss Lockwood's name just now. Oh, no, 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 no. That's no good. I wouldn't believe you now if you swore it under oath. I'll believe no one but the woman herself. Where does she live? Tell me where she lives, you noxious little insect. It's her, miss. Who? The Contessa. She says she has to talk to you at once. What impertinence! Tell her to go to the devil! No, Megan, wait. Show her in. Agnes? She may have some explanation about Ferrari. I want to hear what she has to say. Forgive me, Miss Lockwood. I know you have no desire to lay eyes on me, but I have to ask you one simple question. Have you indeed? A question which no one can answer but Miss Lockwood. When the courier Ferrari applied to my late husband for employment, did you... Did you permit Ferrari to make sure of being chosen as our courier by using your name? I have known Ferrari's wife for many years, yes. <laughs> there you are, madam. You've received your answer. I have received my sentence. Just one moment, Contessa. I have answered your question. Now, will you answer one of mine? If I can... You have spoken of Ferrari. No trace of him has been found anywhere in England. Have you any news of him? You will know what has become of Ferrari when the time is ripe. What do you mean? Someone will tell you. Perhaps your ladyship will be the person. Perhaps I will, if... If... if what? If Miss Lockwood forces me to it. How can I do that? Do you mean to say my will is stronger than yours? When I took your hero from you and blighted your life, you were made the instrument of retribution for my sins. I am certain of it. Such things have happened before. One person has been the means of innocently ripening the growth of evil in another. Henry, do you understand what she's saying? There's nothing easier. She knows perfectly well what has become of Ferrari and she's simply trying to confuse you with a cloud of nonsense. You must make allowances for women, Mr Westwick. We all talk nonsense. So goodbye, Miss Lockwood. We shall meet again, either here in England or in Venice, where my husband died. And it will be for the last time. Do you think she is mad? I think she is simply wicked. I believe she came here to enjoy the luxury of frightening you. She has frightened me. I'm anxious about you, Agnes. If, if I hadn't been here, who knows what that vile woman might have said or done. It's all right, Henry. No, Agnes, please. Listen, I, I can't bear the thought of you spending your life alone and unprotected, especially after what's happened today. I don't need protecting, Henry. Of course you do. All women need protection. You must know how I've always dreamed of being the one who does protect you. Please, Henry, don't. Have I offended you? Of course not. And I know how you feel, Henry. And of course I'm touched and grateful, but... But you don't return my feelings. It's too soon, Henry. It's too soon to know what I feel about anything. I'm sorry, I've been very clumsy. I know. You're only concerned for my well-being. But I can set your mind at rest about that, at least. For the next year, I shall be well looked after. Oh, by whom? By none other than your brother Francis, and my oldest friend in the world, 
Susanna. You're going to live with him? Oh, I shall earn my keep, Henry. I shall spend my time as governess to their delightful children. Yes, but... It will give me time to think, Henry. To recover. To sort out the jumble in my poor, confused head. When you say sort it out... Please, you... Henry. I've no idea what I'll be feeling a year from now. I'm not saying things will be different. And I'm not saying they won't be, either. I know it isn't fair, but it is the best I can do. All right, then. A year it is. Francis? Francis! Good Lord! Henry, is it really you? It's really me, big brother. But I had no idea you were in Paris. No, I wasn't, until an hour ago. I've just got off the train. Well, well. What are you doing here? What do you think? Come to see my nieces and nephews. I haven't laid eyes on them for over a year. I see. Well, touching as this display of avuncular devotion undoubtedly is, you're sure it isn't their governess you've come to see? Well, Agnes, too, of course. How is she? Uh, as sweet and charming as ever. But has she recovered to any degree? Uh, you'd better come back to the hotel. Perhaps the sight of you will put some colour in her cheeks. Agnes, are you busy? Not in the least. Simone has taken the children to the Tuileries and I'm doing my best to correct their mathematics. Good. I've timed it perfectly. I had a surprise for you. Henry. He arrived in Paris this very morning. Agnes, it's wonderful to see you again. Well, I'll leave you to it. I have various things I must attend to. So, Agnes, how are you? As you see me, Henry, how do I appear to you? Not terribly happy, I must say. No. I thought... I thought with all the time that's gone by, you might have come to a different frame of mind. Did you? Well, I'm sorry to have to disappoint you. Agnes! Henry, when I see you, it reminds me of everything I've suffered. Can't you see? It's left its mark on me for life. I swear, Francis, I'll never understand women. As long as I live... <laughs> You must give her time, Henry. Time? I've given her a whole year. It's true, Francis. I thought that being with us and the children would help her to take a more positive attitude. Mm, she seems to feel the loss of Montbarry as though he died faithful to her. Mm. She mourns him in a way that none of us does. Well, even if he was unworthy of her, he was still the man of her choice. Mm. It's in her nature to be faithful to his memory. <sighs> I don't know, Henry. Perhaps things will change when we get to Venice. Venice? It's our next port of call. We're going to try out this wonderful new hotel everyone's talking about, the palace. Perhaps the change will have a beneficial effect on Agnes. For heaven's sake, Herbert died in Venice. It will only make matters worse. Or it might bring things to a head, enable her to say goodbye to him once and for all. Henry, I've just had the most wonderful idea. Why don't you come with us to Venice? What? That's an excellent idea. Why don't you do that, little brother? Stay here for the next couple of weeks, and then we can all travel together. The idea doesn't seem to appeal. No, no, it's not that, is it? Just, I, I don't think Agnes would relish my company at the moment. I seem to irritate her, to say the least of it. I think, I think it's wiser if I make my farewells. All right, then. You leave. Go on to Venice ahead of us. And meanwhile, I'll use all my best efforts on Agnes, try and convince her that she's done her duty by Montbarry's memory, and that it's time she was free to think about her own happiness. By the time we join you, she might be in a different frame of mind. What do you think? Your cigar, signore. Oh, thank you. Can I fetch you anything else? No, no, that's all. Thank you. 
It's a lovely night, isn't it, Signore? Mm. Yeah, it certainly is. Lovely night in a lovely city. Good night, Signore. Good night. Oh. Hello? Who's there? You! Mr. Westwick. For a moment, I couldn't believe it. Contessa, what are you doing in Venice? I heard you and your brother had gone to America. Oh, you heard correctly. Uh, may I sit down? I'm smoking a cigar. I like cigars. Well, sit down then. I can't stop you. Thank you. So I take it you lost your appetite for things American? I lost more than my appetite. I lost my companion. Oh, I see. He found more congenial company? Another sister, perhaps? He died. Oh, dear. Shot to death in a gambling saloon. My brother died no extraordinary death, Mr. Westwick. He sank with many other unfortunate wretches under a fever prevalent in a city we happened to be visiting. And now you've returned to Venice, in spite of what must surely be unhappy memories. Yes. I couldn't help myself. Whatever do you mean? If I had the will of my own, I would never have set foot in Venice. I hate the wretched city. But... <laughs> Here I am. Uh, tell me, when does Miss Lockwood arrive? How the devil did you know Agnes was coming here? Let's say that I guessed it. And do you know why? I've no idea what the superficial reason may be. I only know that we are to meet by chance, by destiny. Call it whatever you like. Mm, chance seems to have a queer way of bringing the meeting about. We've arranged to stay at the Palace Hotel. Your name is not on the visitors' list. Surely you understand my reasons for shunning that hotel. I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea. If you say so. Nevertheless, I think you are right, Mr. Westwick. Destiny demands that I move into the Palace Hotel. <laughs> I shall see to it immediately. Oh, isn't it beautiful? In the moonlight? What? The church of San Marco. <sighs> Goodbye, San Marco, by moonlight. I shall not see you again. You mean she's here? In Venice? More than that. She's moved into the palace. Oh, that's absolutely dreadful. Well, we can't possibly stay in the same hotel as that woman. I suppose we shall just have to move bag and baggage. Oh, don't be absurd, Francis. I'm sorry, but there really is no need for it. Are you sure, Agnes? Quite, quite sure. Henry, have you actually talked to the wretched woman? I exchanged a few words with her, yes. Well, perhaps you can persuade her to move. She must see the situation is impossible. I think that might be rather difficult. I got the impression that she booked in here with the specific intention of seeing Agnes. You, boy, come here. Yes, Signora, how can I be of service? Tell me, do they pay you good wages for the job you do? The money is poor, Signora, but the tips sometimes can be very good. Ah, yes, the tips. What would you say to a hundred lira? What would the signora require of me in order to earn such a gratuity? Hmm, nothing bad. I just want you to help me play a joke. Signora? A harmless joke on a friend of mine. You can have no objection to that, surely. Oh, 
Agnes, my dear, whatever is it? Oh, Francis. Oh, God, the things I've seen. Have another sip, my dear. No, no, I'm all right. You're not all right. I will be in a minute. Agnes, can you tell us what happened? It was the room. I had to sleep in a different room. Why? There'd been some sort of accident in mine. So they took me to another room. Room 14. I felt uncomfortable in it from the start. I don't know why. It was a perfectly decent, well-furnished room. But there was something about it, something oppressive. Nevertheless, I, I got into bed, and after a little while I managed to get to sleep. And then, when I woke up... It was the Contessa, sitting in a chair opposite the bed, looking straight at me. Except she wasn't looking at me, she was asleep. Either that or, or she'd fainted. Wake up! How dare you! How, how did you get in? I shouted at her, but she didn't answer. Didn't stir, just went on... Sitting there. L leave the room! I'll, I'll call for help! But still, she didn't move. And then... And then... Oh, dear. God, I shall never forget it. Agnes, dear. No, I'm all right. It was a head... A terrible human head floating in the air in the middle of the room. I've never seen anything like it. There was no flesh. The skin was stretched tight over the bones and, and dark, like the skin of a mummy. The eyes were closed. The lips, oh, oh, horrible blue lips, were pulled back from the teeth in it terrible grin. For a moment it seemed suspended between the floor and the ceiling and then it started to descend towards me. Oh, oh, oh my dear God! Oh and then there was this vile smell like the smell of graveyards and then the head stopped moved away from me, moved towards the Contessa as she lay in the chair. And then... And then the eyes opened. Oh! The eyes, bright, with the glassy film of death, were fixed on the Contessa with a look of unbearable hatred. And then slowly, they turned back to me. Oh, my dear. The head floated across the room towards the chimney place. It turned round and fixed that terrible glance on me one more time, almost as though it was beckoning to me. And then it went into the wall. <gasps> You say this is where the head disappeared? Just there, at this very spot. Sounds surprisingly hollow. Does that mean anything? Well, there are two possibilities. Either Agnes dreamt the whole thing... It wasn't a dream. Oh, I only wish it was. Or the thing was trying to tell her something. Draw attention to whatever lies behind this wall. I think we should get hold of the manager. 
Persuade him by whatever means we can to let us take the plaster down. Ah, oh, Henry. I've just learnt the most extraordinary thing. I was talking to the servant who made you change rooms last night. I put the fear of God into him and he finally told me the truth. About what? There was nothing wrong with your original room. He was paid to trick you into sleeping here last night. God. Paid by whom? By the Contessa. I'm right, aren't I, Henry? You are. She wanted me to sleep here last night. She wanted me to see what I saw. I think it was her way of confessing. Confessing to what? I shudder to think. Well, one thing. The misbehaviour of one of his employees might give us a little leeway with the manager. All right. Stand well back. Let's see what we have here. Signore, perhaps in these circumstances I should be the one. No, 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 no. I'd, ra I'd rather see for myself. Henry? In just a moment. Go. Well? There's a body. Oh. <gasps> It's a man. Just about all you can tell. It has rotted away to almost nothing. Oh, terrible. Can I see? No, no, you most certainly cannot. Stay there. There's no point, anyways. There's nothing anyone could identify him by. Hardly any face, clothing. It, it must have been there well over a year. Ah, over a year. Does that signify? I was merely thinking, Signore, that, that the hotel has only been open a few months. Whoever is responsible for this terrible thing, it, it must have been before that time. But surely during the rebuilding? Uh, no, Signore. This part of the palace was left unaltered. Some decorating, yes, but the structure was left exactly as it was. Ferrari! What? What do you mean? In his last letter to Emily, Ferrari said Herbert was angry because he could only rent the palace for a few months. It was going to be turned into a hotel. This must be the place. Well, it is possible, I suppose. I'm certain of it. I think this is the room in which Herbert died. That's why the Contessa wanted me to sleep here. Yes, but even so, it doesn't account for the body behind the wall. <sighs> Poor Emily. Emily? It's Ferrari. I'm sure it is. Of course. Of course, you're right. They, they put him there. They? The Contessa and her so-called brother. It, Ferrari never walked out without giving notice. They killed him and hid his body behind the wall. But why? Because he knew something about Herbert's death. I don't care what the famous Dr Bruno says. I've always known there was something suspicious about Herbert dying of bronchitis. Ferrari must have found out the truth. And they killed him to shut his mouth. No, I am sorry, Signore. There can be no doubt at all. I will stake my reputation. Your brother died a natural death. But couldn't there have been some sort of poison? No, there is no poison that can imitate the symptoms of bronchitis. And all the symptoms were present. Symptoms? Yes. Difficulties in breathing, fever, occasional lapses of the mind. But what do you mean, lapses? I would speak to him in English and he would answer in Italian. I would switch to Italian, he would answer in English. It was no matter, most of the time he could hardly speak at all. Go on. I attended him for three days, giving him what medical care I could. For a time I thought he might rally, but on the fourth day he contracted severe pneumonia, by the fifth day he was dead. Before he died, did he ask you to do anything for him? Yes, yes, he gave me a letter. He begged me to post it for him. His eyes were full of entreaty, like those of a spaniel. Do you remember who it was addressed to? Of course, yes, to a Mrs Emily Ferrari. I still can't imagine why he did that, why it was so important. I do not know, Signore. He said nothing. Now, is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, actually, Doctor. There is one last question I'd like to ask. You go up and tell the others, Henry. I'll wait here. Will, we, will you be all right? Yes. I'll sit on the veranda. There's so much to think about. Oh, I'll be back directly. You're sure you'll be all right? Quite sure, Henry. Off you go. 
Ah, uh, Mr. Lockwood. Oh, yes. What is it? I have a message for you from the Contessa Narona. It's a little strange. Uh, perhaps you will understand it. What did she say? She said it was uh, time for you to keep your final appointment. Uh, is she in her room? No, she said she would wait for you on the Ponte della Paglia. Uh, where is that? It is near the Bridge of Sizer, uh, by the Grande Canal. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I know it. When Mr. Westwick comes back, will you tell him where I've gone? You will not wait for him? No. This is a private appointment. So, you are here at last. Yes, I'm here. Beautiful, is it not? The moonlight on the water. I see from your face that you know everything. Oh, I know nothing. I have guessed a great deal. We went to see the doctor who attended Herbert when he was dying. He said something very strange. And what was that? He said that in his delirium, Herbert lapsed back and forth between English and Italian. But Herbert knew almost no Italian. And perhaps he learned it on his travels. And the doctor said something else. He said when Herbert asked him to post the letter to Mrs. Ferrari, his eyes were full of entreaty, like a spaniel's. Hmm. It seemed an odd way to think of Herbert. So... I asked the doctor one more question. Yes? I said, do you mean his eyes were brown, like those of a spaniel? And he said yes. Well, Herbert's eyes were blue. Blue as the sea. It was Ferrari's eyes that were brown. It wasn't Herbert, was it? Who died in that bed? It was Ferrari. <sighs> you discovered that Ferrari was ill knew that it was bound to be fatal, and so you found the perfect plan for killing Herbert with impunity. Uh. Ferrari would pretend to be Herbert all the time Dr. Bruno was treating him. In exchange, you would care for Ferrari's wife and children to the tune of a thousand pounds. Poor, wretched man. How could he refuse? It's the truth, isn't it? Why do you even ask? You know everything. No. I don't know what happened to Herbert. Did he suffer? Not greatly. It was poison. Oh. Something the Baron had found. He put it in his wine. It was painful, but it was over very quickly. Poor Herbert. Poor Herbert. He was not a good man. You know that. He didn't deserve to die like that. Oh, perhaps not. <sighs> and Ferrari, did he know what you'd done? He knew nothing. Perhaps he guessed. What difference does it make now? Of course it can be argued that you can prove none of this. I'm sure if we opened Herbert's coffin, even after all this time... There would be enough discrepancies to prove the body wasn't his. Good. So there is no escape. You have done what you were always meant to do. I, I don't understand you. From the moment we met, when you first looked into my eyes, you said I was your evil angel. More certainly than I have ever known anything in my life. Then why did you do it? Were you so weak? Were you so much in the Baron's power? All you had to do was refuse. Oh, oh. oh, how easy it must be for someone who has lived the life you have to speak of resisting temptation. <laughs> if you only knew. But never mind, you are right. In the end, we bring our fate on ourselves. You are not to blame. Go now. Your work is finished. It's strange. I almost want to thank you. Thank me? It's as though... by finding out the truth about Herbert... 
I am finally free of his memory. Good. Then I have been of some service. Go to your destiny. We shall not meet again. Pray for me. Agnes, thank God. I was worried about you. Oh, there was no need, Henry. I was simply keeping an appointment. How could you let yourself be alone with that woman, knowing what she's capable of? It's done now, Henry. It's finished. Finished? It's only just begun. I'm going straight to the authorities to tell them everything we know. What was that? Nothing. Really? I thought I heard... Perhaps she's found some sort of peace. What? I, I don't understand. Never mind. Henry, would you like to take me home now? Agnes, you very well know I've been waiting all my life to take you home. Good. Let's go then, shall we? In the Haunted Hotel by Wilkie Collins, dramatized for radio by Rod Beecham, Agnes Lockwood was played by Jasmine Hyde, Henry Westwick by Harry Lloyd, Countess Narona, Adjua Ando, Francis Westwick, Simon Bubb, Susanna Westwick, Catherine Igo, Emily Ferrari, Alex Rivers, Megan, Josie Kidd, Dr. Wybrow, Gerard McDermott, Carstairs, James Laley, and Dr. Bruno by Rod Beecham. Other parts were played by the cast, and the play was directed by Bruce Young. <laughs>